development is the use of thorium. And I need you to be aware of it because we have choices. I mean, in the era, I'm disappointed that Nevis has not yet used geothermal energy. I hope it will happen because it's a cheap and lasting <laughs> source of energy. But thorium, a marble sized piece of thorium, can produce all the energy that humans will ever need. It can generate 639,000 times more energy than oil, and 99, create 99% 99 less waste than coal. It's four times more abundant than uranium in nature, and it does not create carbon emission, emissions. And that's the cost there. $80, 0.00008 of a cent, right? So we are looking at radical changes in energy and energy costs for the human race to live in the future world. These are all the numerous amazing game changing bases for the new industrial revolution can of course be suppressed. Yet I think there will be no stopping such gigantic changes which will revitalize the USA economy and reconfirm its status as a major industrial country in the world. I started by implying that it's going to have trouble with its currency, lots of its reserve status, but it has all the necessary technologies of which we speak and more over a thousand plus patents that are very important to the new industrial revolution. And so it's going to regenerate faster than all other countries in the world, and so should be very important to us in the Caribbean. We need, ladies and gentlemen, to change our mindset. Oh, I'm missing it out again. I have a heavy toucher. <laughs> We have merely scratched the surface, but that's okay. And I hope that's impressive enough what we have just said. What will happen with all these kinds of changes will be considerable changes in society, the nature of governmental power, and the levels of undreamed of prosperity for us. Such sharp, discontinuous changes will bring great pain to our Caribbean economy and our lives while the new industrial revolution is blossoming. But this is the hope. Being aware of these grand changes on the way and being urgently committed to finding ways of becoming, in anticipation, part of the new, makes likely the possibility that our countries can survive and then enjoy astonishing prosperity. So I'm not presenting to you a doomsday scenario or end times for that matter, and I'm not making any biblical predictions here. The challenges and opportunities for us come out of a number of issues. In this kind of dispensation where 70 plus plus percent of the work workforce will be replaced by robots. There will be needs for a specifically trained and highly technical workforce, regrettably few in number. Automation and robotization will rapidly vanquish the need for today's workers, so a new society will be necessary. It may be that instead surplus labor will be euthanized, sorry for this cruel injection, through a variety of new chemical technologies which induce massive die-offs of now useless billions of people if wars and new warfare weapons do not directly or indirectly decimate the no longer needed for production population. So the only real way for us as individuals to ensure our future is to invest in our education the developmental skills to innovate, create, and communicate. Things which are not yet anticipated that intelligent, uh, you know, computer control robots will be able to do. So you have to shift out of orderly, structured, regulated jobs, boring daily job, and so on. 
and go into that kind of economic activity. So you have to make your dreams a reality through disciplined self-investment, entrepreneurship, and action. And in my old age, you are told that I have started to be an entrepreneur myself. <laughs> so, basically, where am I? <laughs> a correlative to this is seen in the reversing of the trend towards outsourcing of production and services from industrial economies. The liberal immigration policies will cease totally and the availability of remittances will be seriously curtailed to the Caribbean. And I'm not being speculative here, this is real. You know short financial services such as insurance and banking may die a sudden death as universal money and tighter international control of fly capital made such productive devices of income tax avoidance impossible. Yet, it is also true that a crisis is a transition, not a problem. For those who are prepared to be flexible, to reimagine a new and exciting future, and ditch the normal bias. It's a word I like to use a lot, because we become creatures of habit, creatures of normalcy, and we need to ditch that in these times, which keeps us locked in unproductive and uncreative activity. So one way of getting out of this is to reconceptualize the economy. The very same part breaking new technologies, radically leading us into the new industrial revolution, are accessible through education, research, and intellectual property rights leased or purchased by individuals and countries in all our island states. This allows our countries to be able to speedily possess the capacity to free themselves from several of the constraints of size and lack of resources. Now, a quick review. State-centered policies of development have been tried but in general, the results were and are still suboptimal. Much of this failure to achieve maximum outcomes has been due to the adoption of an inappropriate economic model of development in either the Keynesian, the classical, or neoclassical varieties, which we have been trying out for the past 100 years. We fail to predict or explain the financial collapse and economic recession. We have found ourselves unable to predict or explain sharp fluctuations in economic growth. And all these are real-world phenomena that have recurred repeatedly since the post-war period, and we just haven't been able to handle them or prevent them recurring. We may attenuate them, that is to stretch them out, you know, so that they don't come with full force, but basically we have to solve them. The ECCB or CARICOM should establish a global watch institution or team initially, which will constantly monitor the almost daily stunning developments in science and technology. Talking about thousands of patents that in this day and age are rapidly brought to the market in less than five years used to be 20, 30 years before these invention discoveries are brought to the market. We are in a time where it's almost instant, so we can't wait. This has to be constantly monitored and convert the findings into weekly or monthly policy reports and recommendations to all ministries, private sector groupings, labor unions, non-state actors, and especially to entrepreneurs and potential entrepreneurs. A new and more appropriate economic paradigm should consider the contemporary schools of complexity and evolutionary economics. It's sad to say that these are not really taught in our universities at all. These and other theories have emerged as important critiques of Keynesian and neoclassical thought and the mathematical models and abstractions that reside at the heart of general equilibrium theory. New economic thinking focuses on evolutionary economics, which draws on the work of Joseph Schumpeter 
and complexity science that has its roots in the natural sciences. It touches also on close related fields including behavioral science and the study of networks. So this is the point. This is the core of everything that I have said up to this point. A real economy is not made up of preference charts, <laughs> it's not made up of you know, supply and demand. It is an entity made up of heterogeneous groupings of agents, networks, and institutions which are influenced by and adapt to one another's behavior as well as the surrounding environment. Within the system, activity is driven constantly by a multitude of overlapping and interconnected processes which tend not to lead to a given fixed point or necessarily follow a specific cycle. So this equilibrium theory that characterizes Keynesian and neoclassical theories, of course, is unreal. This is a real thing. This is how an economy actually performs. And so we have to acknowledge this and, and relate to it. So the economy is never in equilibrium or even geared towards achieving equilibrium, but instead is constantly evolving in non-uniform and dynamic ways driven by so-called emergent phenomena. Yet for all this critique, alternative development strategies will fail if deep consideration is not given to how to deal with these in a manner more akin to achieving a win-win situation. So this leads to the next sets of comments. The issue of education and promotion of technological, innovative, and entrepreneurial development in the OECS is of utmost importance and should occur within the framework of the promotion of science and technology as a centerpiece of development strategies. By the way, I'm not a Philistine. I'm just recognizing that science and technology has driven all economic development change in the world, the culture and all that that we are so good at, very important. This will help us to enjoy it even more. Education and training systems needed to be firm, need to be firmly embedded within a much larger configuration of institutions, and that all institutions in this configuration are to be interdependent. In this way, there is less danger that education and training will become less relevant for social needs and global economic participation. You know, most of our education, educated people migrate because they can't find the relevant job suited to their education. Plus, in any case, it's not the one for the new industrial revolution. Oftentimes, our Caribbean government supporting institutions and economic partners seem inadequately aware of global impacts on their economy and are equally unaware of the oftentimes inappropriate response they make to it. And you know from my comments on various election time activities throughout this region that it's almost as if they are totally blind to this. I can't believe it because when I speak to them one to one, they seem to know of it. But it's never a part of their development strategy. Therefore, the state must be willing to learn from experience, adapt its approaches, policy making needs are more flexible and willing to break with organizational routines. And let me tell you, not in a corrupt way. We break the organizational routines all this while for our friends, for those who finance our election campaigns and so on. That's the wrong way. That's corruption. Real life social networks such as family, friends and colleagues are even more important in helping shape our preferences and beliefs. What we like and what we do not like. People, ordinary people, you and me. Network effects require policy makers, whether the public or corporate spheres, to have a markedly different view of how the world operates. Not even a markedly different view, in words, the real view of how the, the, the world operates. And this is a critical point. Often our politicians, our leaders of industry and I'm glad that many of you are here for this meeting tomorrow. Um, believe 
that they don't face the same factors facing agents. It is not and cannot be in possession of a full set of information. Maybe privatized information, people whispering in your ear, but the total picture is never belonging to any one group, any one category of people operating in our economy. Therefore, the state must be willing to learn from experience and adapt its approaches. Policymaking needs to be more flexible and willing to break with these routines. Seeking to maintain equilibrium leads to a concentration on allocative rather than dynamic efficiency. The focus is on distributive adjustments to actual or possible equilibrium rather than creating the conditions for innovation and growth, which are the necessary things we need to do at this time. And it ignores the possibilities for state intervention, such as shifting the system, not that word, shifting the system, from one institutional or technologically, technological locked in situation or equilibrium to another. And I'm not talking about socialism or you know, some other strangeism that is irrelevant to the real life that people lead. The OECS should not back away from such recognition of the implications of pursuing an alternative economic development path. Indeed, it should countenance development of a new economic paradigm and assist those who engage in productive activities in the OECS to shift from dead-end situations into dynamic opportunities provided by new global openings. Even the EU, European Union, trying to help us to persevere with bananas, and bananas are good for personal and healthy use, but in terms of an international market that will feed and house and clothe the population, it's a dead-end, locked-in situation. We have to break out of these things. This time it seems that the rate of change and its likely radical shift in nature require reflexive and deliberate actions on the part of each country to seek for survival and then success in any emerging order. It will not be easy since the principalities and powers of the current order will be reluctant to change and will subtly or openly delay or block such efforts. Awareness of the realities may